Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Spring Newman Lecture on Making Sense Out of Suffering with Dr. Peter Kreeft. Uh, whether you're a student, faculty member, or a member of the larger community, we want to thank you for coming. My name is Andrew Klabnik, and I am a volunteer missionary at Oregon State University. And my name is Lily Wheaton. I'm also a volunteer missionary at Oregon State, and Andrew and I will be your hosts for tonight's lecture. Uh, before we begin, uh, we just wanted to apologize uh, to all who are hoping to attend this lecture in person. Uh, we thank you for your patience, and we're glad you can still be with us through the live stream. Uh, I hope you are looking forward to tonight's lecture as much as I am. Uh, in college, I remember lots of conversations I had with my peers um, on questions of theology or philosophy, and, and the biggest question most people had was, was, what is the meaning of suffering? Why would a world with a God in it allow for um, suffering. Even if God loves us, what, what is the meaning of all this? So I'm really looking forward, uh, to answer, answering some of those questions and, um, hearing what Dr. Kraft has to say. I graduated from Oregon State University with a degree in rangeland management last June. As a missionary, I now assist with the many different programs that the Newman Center has to offer. But as a student, I also had the opportunity to attend several Newman lectures on various topics. However, I think that this topic is a very relevant one for today. Uh, suffering is a large part of human life, and I believe that it's important to not only ask why we suffer, but also what we can do about it. I look forward to learning from Dr. Kreft about what steps can be taken to understand suffering more and how it plays a role in our daily lives. If this is your first Newman Lecture, uh, we'd like to let you know that Dr. Kraft is only one of a number of speakers who have come to Oregon State for discussions on urgent and thought-provoking topics surrounding philosophy, religious belief, and social issues. Through these lectures and your questions, we hope we can all grow in an understanding of our world, the meaning behind our world, and learn from one another. So now we'd like to explain how the night will go. Dr. Kraft will speak for about 45 minutes and then following the presentation, there'll be time for questions. You can submit any question using the chat function on the live stream. We acknowledge that questions can be very similar, so we'll manage sorting through them as you send them in. We welcome all questions. However, we do ask that they are succinct and to the point. And now uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the night. Dr. Peter Kraft is a professor of philosophy at Boston College and a well-known speaker and writer. He's the author, author of over 80 books, including Making Sense Out of Suffering, an account of his own search for the meaning of suffering. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kraft, and, and thank you again for speaking with us. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, and I've learned that I learn more by teaching than by learning. So I hope to learn from you and some of your questions. Uh, what I want to do is give a, a, a kind of very basic overview of the problem of suffering from a Christian point of view. Uh, I'm not going to say anything terribly new and creative. I'm going to say basically what uh, the church and all the saints teach about suffering. But I want to uh, outline the uh, talk in a kind of logical way. I see a number of different dimensions of the problem, uh, five of them, in fact. Uh, the first and most obvious is the logical problem. Uh, suffering is the strongest argument for atheism, the main reason why people are tempted to leave the faith. How can God let them uh, What's going on here? Why would a, a totally good and totally all-powerful God uh, allow uh, suffering? Second uh, aspect is the psychological question, uh, or philosophically, the epistemological question, which is why haven't we ab been able to give an adequate answer to that? Uh, science and, and, and even common sense and logic can give definitive answers to many questions. Why isn't this one of them? The third dimension is the religious dimension. We, we define religion as man's relationship with God. The question is, how can we still have a loving and trusting relationship of a God who deliberately seems to abandon us to suffering? Uh, Fourth uh, dimension is the kind of dramatic dimension, or you might say the historical dimension. Uh, we live in time, uh, and uh, there's no way out of suffering at any time in the future. To live is to suffer, and eventually we suffer the laws of everything in death. And if you throw God into the picture, 
uh, doesn't God also suffer the loss of at least some sinners if there is an eternal hell? It's a very serious, uh, dramatic, and theological problem. And finally, the practical problem. What can we do about it all? Well, the problem of suffering is one part of the problem of evil. It's not the only kind of evil. There's two kinds of evil. Uh, evil is the opposite of good, but uh, good is not a single idea. It's a number of ideas going together by a kind of analogy. There's the good or evil body. There's the good or the evil of the uh, mind, the good or the evil of the emotions, the good or the evil of the will. There's a lot of different kinds of evil and different kinds of good. And the two basic ones are the evil that's done by us and the evil that is experienced by us, active evil and passive evil. Active evil is sin, and passive evil is suffering, whether it's physical or psychological. And of those two kinds of evil, sin and suffering, sin is the worst evil because for a number of obvious reasons. One is that the soul is more important than the body, and the soul is eternal, and the body isn't. Uh, and I think anybody would rather suffer the loss of their body's powers than their soul's power. Would you rather be uh, crippled or insane? Uh, spiritual evil is the worst evil, and sin is the worst kind of spiritual evil. And fortunately, we have the clearest answer to the worst kind of evil. Uh, the answer to the problem of sin is Jesus Christ, the Savior from sin. When the angel told his father what to name him, he said, you should call his name Jesus because he will save us from what? Did he say political incorrectness or uh, poverty or, uh, or even suffering? No, he said from sin. Christ and his cross are God's answer to the problem of sin. And our part of the answer is to accept that in repentance and faith. That's pretty clear. Suffering is only the second worst kind of evil. It's not the worst kind. Uh, and we only have the second best answer to that because it's a mystery. Why does God allow suffering? The answer is not simple. It's pretty clear why God allows sin. Uh, God allows sin by giving us free will. Uh, a will that can't choose between good and evil is not really free. And why did, give us, why did God give us this free will if he foresaw that we would use it so badly to cause both sin and suffering? And the answer is because God is love. And what love desires is free love from the beloved. Love by nature is free and compel love. So the answer to that deepest of all problems is very strong and clear. Uh, the answer to the problem of suffering uh, is not so clear. And that's the mystery that I'm going to take up tonight. These two kinds of evil, sin and suffering, are connected by what psychologists call the psychosomatic unity, that is the union of the body and the soul. We mustn't think of ourselves as two entities, a body and a soul, like a ghost in a haunted house, or a, a, a machine and, and a spirit inside the machine. Our bodies are not machines, and our souls are not pure spirits or angels. Uh, our souls are related to their, our bodies in the same way that the meaning of a book is related to the words of a book. There are two dimensions of the same book, and you can't change either dimension without changing the other. If you change the words, you automatically change the meaning, and you can't change the meaning in any other way except by changing the words. That's why the soul and the body are always connected. So there's got to be a connection between sin and suffering. And in the Bible, as in most of the myths of most of the religions of the world, there is a, a very strong connection, uh, a kind of paradise lost story, that uh, uh, suffering is a, an inevitable consequence of sin. I like to think of uh, the analogy of a magnet and three iron rings. Uh, if they all stick together, we have health and happiness and harmony. And the magnet is God, the source of all life. And the first iron ring is the soul, which is connected to God by innocence when first creates it. And then there's the body, which is connected to the soul uh, indissolubly 
at the moment of our creation, God did not invent death. There's no reason for the body to die if the life of God keeps pouring from God into the soul and then through the soul into the body. And then the body's relation to the world is one of pure pleasure and no pain. There's no reason why the body should be uh, at odds with the world. So innocence and immortality and painlessness uh, are together in this original Eden. But once the soul, which has free will, decides to sever its relationship with God, divorce itself from God, pull the plug to God, so to speak, uh, sing an octave song, I did it my way, the song they all sing as they enter hell. Once sin happens, the whole uh, chain, the whole iron ring falls apart. Uh, sin causes death. Once the life of God that pours into the soul uh, is corrupted, the life of the soul that, that it pours into the body is also interrupted by death. And the body's relationship with the world is also interrupted by, by all kinds of pain. So let's first look at the logical dimension of this problem. Doesn't, doesn't suffering at least cast great doubt on the goodness of God? It certainly seems to. Uh, the problem could be stated in different ways. Aquinas' way of stating it, I think, is the simplest. He argues that uh, if two things are opposites and one of them is infinite, there's no room for the other one. But God means infinite goodness. So if there's a God, there's no room for his opposite, evil. There is evil. Therefore, it seems that there's no God. A second formulation is a little more detailed. The three attributes that are the most essential for God. You wouldn't give the name God to any being that lacked one of these three attributes. Uh, are goodness and wisdom and power. God is wicked. He's not worthy of the name God. And if God is stupid, he's not worthy of the name God. And if God is weak, he's not worthy of the name God. And if God has unlimited goodness and wisdom and power, it seems to follow that there's no room for evil. Because if he has unlimited goodness, he wants only good. He doesn't want evil. And if he has unlimited wisdom, he knows how to get it. And if he has unlimited power, there's no obstacle to his getting it. But look what he gets, us, a mixture good and evil. You know, there's a little bad in the best of us, as well as a little good in the worst of us. Uh, that's why it ill becomes the best of us to speak ill of the worst of us. Uh, but as Sangin Itzen famously said, the line between good and evil is not outside the self, not between nations or cultures or races or civilizations. It divides every human heart. Why? If there's a God. Third formulation is, is, is maybe even simpler, the happiness formulation. If, if you love somebody, you want to make them happy, and we're not happy. So how could God love us? Finally, there's the injustice formulation. Uh, sinners, of course, may deserve to suffer, but uh, those who are good don't. But suffering is disproportionate. Uh, here, two people are walking down the street. One's a notorious sinner and the other's a great saint. And let's say a bolt of lightning strikes one of them. Which one is it going to strike? We have no idea. It's just as possible that it'll strike the saint as the sinner. We don't get what we deserve. Good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. All right, how do we answer that? Well, let's start with the uh, the simple formulation of evil and good as opposites, and God is infinite goodness, so there's no room for evil. Uh, evil exists, therefore God doesn't. The answer is rather complex and mysterious, and it's got something to do with time. We are in time. Uh, the problem is not like a problem in geometry. It's more like a problem in history, so that the solution doesn't come until the end. We're not at the end yet. We see the results of suffering 
we see good results and bad results. I've talked to and read uh, memoirs from a number of people that have suffered in the Holocaust, and many of them have become very wise and very holy and very patient. Others have become despairing. Uh, suffering doesn't automatically make you wiser and better. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But it can. It can deter us from sin. We're afraid of suffering. It can be just as a punishment for sin, if we deserve it insofar as we do, and we all do somewhat. Uh, it can also limit sin. Uh, what's the most complete suffering? Where do you lose the most? Death. Well, death limits sin. Death is like a tourniquet around the wound of sin. It stops the bleeding. Suppose there were no death. Suppose the transhumanists who are working on the immortality pill in Silicon Valley, not a pill actually, but they, uh, many of them believe that it's scientifically possible to uh, conquer death by genetic engineering. Suppose they're right. And suppose they abolish death. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I think it's horrible. Uh, if you want to see what kind of a world they would create if they succeed, just leave a dozen eggs on your kitchen table for about six months and then come back and smell. As C.S. Lewis says somewhere, we're like eggs at present. If we don't hatch, we go rotten. The angel that God sent uh, to keep Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden uh, so that they had to go into the wilderness east of Eden, the angel with the flaming sword, was not merely a just punishment for their sin, it was also a mercy. Why was that angel there? Because he had to protect the tree of eternal life, which was the other tree in the garden. Once they had eaten the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, if they had also eaten the fruit of eternal life, they would have been eternalized in evil forever. That would be hell on earth. Sometimes suffering, which seems to be a bad thing, is a good thing. Death is the clearest example of that. All right, let's look at the next formulation of the argument. Uh, God has to have these three divine attributes. He's got to be all good, all powerful, and all knowing. If he's all good, he wills only good. If he's all powerful, he attains what he wills. If he's all knowing, he knows exactly how to do it. So if such a God existed, the incredible consequence would be that there is no evil, but there is evil. Augustine's answer to that question is very simple. God does not do evil, but he allows it. He can stop it. He can stop it miraculously. He doesn't. Why? Only one possible reason. For God is all wise, all knowing, and all powerful. He sees that he can make a greater good come out of it. Use evil for good. Look what he did 2,000 years ago. He used characters like Judas Iscariot and King Herod and Pontius Pilate we affect our redemption. Hmm. The worst thing that ever happened, not only allowed by God, but strategized by God. In fact, he came to earth to make it happen, namely his own martyrdom. The deliberate torture and murder of God Almighty, the worst thing that ever happened. We are going to celebrate a week from now in a holiday that we call Good Friday. That's quite astonishing. I sympathize with people who say Christianity is, is, is crazy, but it's at least interesting. I have no patience with people who say Christianity is boring. It's incredibly surprising and dramatic. So the argument is, if God existed, then Romans 8.28 would be true. All things work together for good for those who love God. And the argument then goes on to say, but that is not true. Therefore, there's no God. Well, the second premise is false. It is true. It can be true. We don't see it yet because we're not yet in Act 5 of the play. There's room for a, an intelligent faith, despite the fact that we, not being in Act 5 of the play, don't see it yet. We can believe it. Another formation, a formulation, the happiness formulation, uh, is uh, if God has these three attributes, he would want to make us happy, and we're not. 
therefore he must be lacking in one of these attributes. Well, it depends on what you mean by happiness. The ancient Greek word for happiness, eudaimonia, or uh, an even stronger word, makarios, doesn't mean simply being content or having your desire satisfied. It means being perfect, being complete, being good. Look at that word eudaimonia. It starts with you, E-U, which is a Greek prefix, which means good, which means yeah, good to be happy. And then at the middle of the word, the word daimon means spirit or soul. Happiness is fundamentally a matter of the, the spirit or the soul, not the body. That's secondary. Uh, and then the last two letters, ia, uh, makes an adjective into a noun. Uh, so it makes a, a temporary feeling into a long-lasting objective state. So in the ancient meaning of happiness, suffering is not incompatible with happiness. We need suffering to teach us wisdom. If you've never suffered, you're, you're not going to be wise. And you need wisdom to be happy, truly happy. So you need suffering in order to be truly happy. Our modern English word, happiness, is a very shallow word. It comes from the old English hap, which means luck or chance or good fortune. Uh, if your friend has a big smile on his face today, uh, what's the first thing you probably say to him? Hey, just what, hap what happened to you? Just win the lottery? How shallow that is. We think of happiness as something that comes to us from without and just gives us a temporary high. There's a much deeper meaning of happiness a meaning which requires suffering as one of its ingredients because it goes to wisdom. Finally, there's the formulation that uh, uh, if, if we suffer and don't apparently deserve it, that then God is unjust. God does not justly apportion suffering. Now that's the problem of the book of Job. Job is a good man and he suffers more than people who are less good than him. Well, that's not fair. Why do bad things happen to good people? It would be fair if bad things happen to bad people, but they don't. They happen to good people just as much, if not more. Well, one answer is that there are no such things as good people. The real problem is why do so many good things happen to bad people? If you don't have a fundamental intuitive sense of thanks and divine generosity, look at all the good things in your life. Uh, they inevitably outnumber the bad things, but the bad things get our attention. And bad things don't just happen to good people. Evil doesn't just happen. It doesn't come out of the blue. It's part of a story. And in a good story, nothing just happens. There are causes. Sometimes the causes are mysterious, but it's, it's part of a meaningful story. The notion that life is meaningless is a terrifying notion. Uh, life is bad, life is tough, life uh, is unjust. Well, at least there's a meaning there. You can fight that, but life is meaningless. That's, you give up. There's nothing there, absolutely nothing. We think of justice often as a kind of rational equality. Everybody should have equal rights and everybody should get exactly what they deserve. Maybe that's not what God means by justice. When St. Paul wrote the Epistle of the Romans, the first eight chapters of that epistle are basically the outlines of systematic theology for the next 2,000 years. Uh, and the subject that he's going to talk about is the righteousness of God. And the word translated righteousness there is DK or dikaiosune, the Greek word for justice. So he's going to talk about justice. And what's the most important center of the justice of God? What, what does he mean by the justice of God? Christ. The crucifixion of Christ. The cross is the justice of God. That certainly doesn't look like equality. It's something very, very different. Justice is a story. It's not just a formula. And a story has to be unpredictable. Uh, mathematics is 
an honorable and important science, but it's not very interesting because there's no drama to it. Two and two are four, and that doesn't change. But justice is not like mathematics. Justice is like a good story with a totally satisfying ending. Something organic. Uh, and it's, it's not geared to individuals, but to the whole human race, because our fundamental relationship to each other, we want to be altruistic love, is not a relationship of equality, but inequality. It's my life for yours. Look at the relationship between yourself and your parents. They gave you life. They gave you education. They gave you their time. They laid down their lives for you. You, you can't do that to them. You can't give that to them. That's why God invented the family, which is the pay it forward system. Have children. Give that gift on to the children. Pass on the baton. That's much more interesting than, uh, than equality. Let's go to the second dimension of the problem, uh, the psychological dimension, the epistemological dimension. Why, why is the problem of suffering something that we can't ever hope to have an adequate and clear answer to in this life? And if you think you can, I'd like to play Socrates with you and ask you a few little questions. Uh, Real Marcel, the French Catholic existentialist philosopher, famous for distinguishing among all the questions we can ask between problems and mystery. Uh, and the obvious distinction is that mysteries are questions that we don't have an adequate answer to. Partial answer, but not a total answer. Problems, we can have a total answer to. Uh, how much are two plus two? How can I fix this car? How much will this house call? Uh, what's going to happen to the ball game tomorrow? Uh, there are definitive answers to those questions. And once you have the answer, you have all that you can know about it. And then you go on to something else. Science and technology is a set of problems. Uh, it produces more problems and nobody knows at all, but we have definitive answers. But the most important question in our life, like why do we fall in love? And what is beauty? And why must we die? And why are we so fascinated with music? And why do we suffer? These are all mysteries in the sense that nobody has an adequate answer to them. Why? Because we are those mysteries. We are not those problems. I am not two plus two equals four. I am not a car that will be fixed. By the way, when people have problems, don't try to fix them. They're not machines. Uh, we live mysteries. And life is essentially a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. We are involved in them. We can't become detached from them. Why is evil a problem? Because we are evil. And secondly, because we're not God. Uh, you think that's obvious? I find myself continually having to remind myself of that. Which is why my favorite sermon of all time is the... Uh, very short sermon that God preached to St. Catherine in a vision. He said, there's only two things you have to know. Here's a summary of all of divine revelation. Number one, I'm God. Number two, stop the presses, call out the reporters. Uh, we did not design our own life. We are Hamlet. We're not Shakespeare. Shakespeare knows exactly what he's doing in Hamlet, but Hamlet doesn't. Which are we? If you could reduce life to a problem, and if you could solve it definitively, and if there was total clarity and total certainty and total proof and total answer to the problem of evil, there'd be no room left for faith. You're not free to think that two and two are not four, but you're free to trust or not trust, to love or not to love. Bertrand Russell, one of the most intelligent atheists of modern times, uh, was an atheist most of his life, and he died quite late in his late 90s. And a friend came to him and said, Bertie, you've been an atheist all your life, and you know you're going to die very soon. Uh, don't you think you better ask the question, uh, what if you find out that there is a God after all? What would you say to him? And Russell said in his inimitable way, I suppose that's uh, 
a fair question. I would suppose I should say, uh, sir, to address in a honorific way, uh, sir, evidently you would work as exist, and evidently my atheistic hypothesis was erroneous. Would you mind answering me one wee little question? Why the hell didn't you give us more evidence? No, that's a very scientific, rationalistic question. But that's not the question you ask about a drama or a love affair. Uh, God wants to make room for the leap of faith. Uh, Romeo doesn't come proposing to Juliet with a bunch of philosophers proving in syllogisms that she should elope with him. He doesn't come with a bunch of lawyers. He doesn't even have a prenup. He says, jump into my arms. That's what love does. Pascal says, if God gave us more light, we wouldn't have much freedom. Uh, you don't have freedom to believe or not to believe in the sun. You can see it. And if he gave us no light at all, uh, we could never hope to find him. But if he gives us clues, that stimulates us to move, to fight, to, uh, to fight the good fight, uh, to strive, to exert our will. And love comes from the will. Now, if there were a God who was all wise, all powerful and all good, exactly what he would do. Keep us in partial ignorance and partial knowledge. Well, our partial ignorance confirms the theistic hypothesis. If we didn't have it, that would prove that we're as wise as God, and then we would be atheists. So the strongest argument for atheism is really a refutation of atheism, or at least a, uh, a statement that if there were a God, we would find the same kind of world that we do find. A deeper dimension of the problem is a religious. Re the word religion comes from uh, the Latin religare, which means uh, a, a binding relationship. Religion is essentially man's relationship to God. And that relationship has to be uh, one of love and trust you always belong together. You can't love somebody you don't trust. You can't trust somebody you don't love. So the religious problem is how can I trust a God who lets me suffer? C.S. Lewis, in his wonderful little uh, diary that he wrote uh, when his wife was, was dying, called A Grief Observed, which is the best book I know to give to people who have lost a loved one. Uh, like Job, allows his faith to be deeply tested and, and questions it very deeply. And he says, when Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Might it be that he himself lost faith? And he found out that God is not trustable. He lets himself express that doubt and then he answers it. Doubts are not sins, if they're honest and, and, and God-seeking. Doubts are the ants in the pants that keep faith alive and moving. So the question, how can I trust a God who lets me suffer so, uh, is in one sense very simple, by freely choosing to. The option is open. It's not irrational. The book's not closed. It's open. Uh, and when Christ said those horrible words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, and probably quoting the whole Psalm. Read the whole Psalm. It moves from that agony to trust. And when you question something, you appreciate the answer better. And when you risk things and when you succeed in that risk, you appreciate them far better than when you don't risk them. So don't be afraid to be utterly honest with God and shake your fist in his face and say, how can you do this, you bloody butcher? That's what you really mean. And he might give you an answer. What he doesn't want is indifference. He never speaks against honest, agonizing, hard questions. What he speaks against most strongly is indifference. There's a shocking word in the book of Revelation where, uh, where Christ speaks to the seven churches, and one of them is the church of Laodicea. He says, you're neither hot nor cold. 
I wish that you were either hot or cold. If you wish you were neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's a shocking word. Vomit. Or Great saints are always made from passionate people. You know, Augustine was the playboy of the Western world, and Ignatius Loyola was a mercenary killer. And St. Paul was a real nasty torturer of Christians. Uh, and they all made great saints. You don't make great saints out of milk toasts. As far as moving very fast in the wrong direction, uh, it takes quite a bit of effort to make a 180 degree turn, but not nearly as much effort as it takes to start up a car, it's not moving at all. Let's go to the fourth formulation of the problem of evil, the, uh, the dramatic one. Life is a drama, life is a story, and we're always at risk, and we always lose things, and in death we lose everything, so life seems to end as a tragedy. And even from God's point of view, he seems to lose everything, he loses any of his beloved children to hell. Well, the answer to life is a tragedy is, well, it's not true that life stinks and then you die. It doesn't stink. Good as well as evil. Uh, it's mysterious. It's not that evil simply eliminates good or that good simply eliminates evil. And of course, death is not the end. It's like birth. And from the viewpoint of the next life, according to St. Teresa, even a life full of suffering is no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. She has a right to, uh, to say that. She suffered a lot in her life. Life as a story has at least two stages, a problem and a solution. Suffering and its deliverance, sorrow and joy. The alternative lacks all dramatic meaning. Suffering is like the waves that make surfing possible. God comes to us on those waves. They're terrifying sometimes, but like real. Really, life has three stages. Uh, every plot, every story that's ever told, first of all, has to set up a situation, and then it upsets it or threatens it, and then it resets it or addresses the upset. Uh, Story in the Bible, which is the only book that begins at the very beginning and ends at the very end and puts everything in between, uh, which tells the complete story, uh, has three stages, creation, fall, and redemption. And all three of them are in the first three chapters of Genesis. The creation in chapter one and two, and the fall in chapter three. And it's so, as soon as the fall happens, God begins the process of redemption, which is the rest of of, of it. Now we're in a story, and that's why there is fall as well as redemption. The story is about free will characters. It's not a story about the setting, it's a story about the characters. The setting doesn't have free will, the characters do. But what about God's problem? His beloved children, some of them go to hell. If there's no hell, then Jesus is a fool or a heretic uh, or a bad psychologist. Uh, nobody knows how many people are in there, but uh, when the disciples ask Jesus that question, Lord, will many be saved? Uh, he doesn't say, oh, don't worry about it. Nobody will. Nor does he say 51% uh, will, will not be saved. He says, strive to enter in. So I'm not speculating about numbers. We shouldn't do that. Many people in the past thought most people go to hell. Most people today believe most people don't go to hell. The answer is we don't know. But what we do know is what the road is. Well, the reason there has to be hell is free will. Uh, that's the bottom line. Scratch the notion of free will and you find the possibility of hell underneath. Because if, if God is love, then heaven wouldn't be heaven to you unless you're in love with love. And if you love hate and you hate love, then you don't want to go to heaven. Heaven is not just a pleasure palace. Heaven is what God is. Total truth, total love. Some people don't like that. 
Remember when you were really nasty as a kid? We all had our nasty streaks, I think. Uh, think of the nastiest thing you ever did. And your parents were, were kind of stern with you, of course, but they forgave you. And you probably didn't forgive yourself. And when your mother or your father hugged you and said, I love you anyway, you probably were devastated by that. You wanted to fight with them. Well, that's a little bit of hell in your life. Magnify that into a whole heart and a whole life. And I think you can see that such a person just can't go to heaven. You wouldn't enjoy it. I don't think you have to believe that the imagery is literal. Is, is it physical fire? Are there demons with pitchforks? Uh, the imagery is obviously uh, meant to scare the hell out of you. And that's good. But uh, to take something seriously is not necessarily to take it literally. I personally think hell is worse than fire. I think if there were physical fire in hell, it wouldn't be so bad. Because fire is beautiful. God invented it. Nothing beautiful about it. Nothing beautiful in hell at all. I think hell is absolute and total loneliness and hopelessness. Uh, you, you can't get out of your ego. You wish there were fire. Sometimes physical pain is not the worst thing. When you're, when you're in deep despair, the two things you often do uh, are you bang your head against the wall or you tear your hair out. Well, that sounds very stupid because those are very painful things. But when you're in deep spiritual pain, the pain is so great that you instinctively cause yourself more physical pain to distract yourself from the deeper spiritual pain. It's probably God's love and light itself that tortures the, the damned in hell. Uh, light is not pleasant to those who don't want it. We don't love it. We prefer darkness. But that doesn't answer the question, how is it that God doesn't lose if some of his beloved children are in hell? And I say two things to that. First of all, I confess I don't know the answer. And secondly, I thank God that that's his problem, not ours. that the third temptation in the wilderness when the devil offered Jesus all the kingdoms of his world uh, was, was not a temptation to money and power. Most of us would succumb to that kind of temptation. I think he was, he was saying to Jesus, I will, I will make you a success. You came to save everybody. Okay, it's not going to work if you do it your way. But if you worship me instead of your father, for just one minute, just bow the knee to me. I'll open the gates of hell. I'll renounce my right to all those beloved children of yours who are there. And you can have them. Uh, that's a real temptation. Well, let's end with the practical problem. What can you do? This was mostly philosophy, theology, theory. Uh, what do we do? Well, there's four possible answers to that question. One answer is to simply give up. You can't do anything. That's a coward. A slightly better answer is, well, we can at least mitigate our suffering. Uh, I think the science that pleases God the most is medicine. Medical technology has relieved us of a very large percentage of our suffering. And we can also add many joys to compensate for our suffering. And we can use suffering to develop virtues, especially courage and compassion and hope. In a world without suffering, you don't need courage. You don't need to develop that strength. And in a world where nobody suffers, there's no need for compassion. And in a world where there's no suffering and nothing but joy, there's no need for hope. This isn't heaven. We need hope. Christianity doesn't 
totally solve the problem of suffering, but it gives you the most effective possible answer to it uh, in transforming its meaning. Christ does that to everything. Christ transforms meaning. He's, he's the one who takes the one at the top of the totem pole and puts them at the bottom and vice versa. He humbles the proud and exalts and, and the humble. He does the same with suffering and death. Let's look at death first. What does he do with death? He makes it into a door to heaven. There's an oratorio that goes this way. Thou hast made death glorious and triumphant, for through its portals we enter into the presence of a living God. The worst thing can become the best thing. And suffering is a kind of a little death. So suffering can be part of our redemption. We can literally join it to Christ's suffering. Not simply by thinking about it, and not even simply by the proper attitude towards it, but ontologically. If you have been baptized, you are part of Christ's body. And the body is not just his, his organization. He's not just a CEO. He's the head. The head and the body are one thing. That round, funny-looking ball between your shoulders, that's not your boss. That's your head. And we are part of his body. So our sufferings are part of his. We participate in what he did. Namely, redemption. We're not only the redeemed, we are also the cooperators in that work of redemption. The church is now considering, and may someday come to the conclusion, that uh, uh, Mary's titles include co redemptrix. Uh, and if she does do that, which I think she will in the future, she will make clear that so are we. We're all called to be saints. She's a super saint. We're all called to be agents in our own redemption through faithfully accepting the sufferings that the loving God gives us and believing that these can be used for supreme good. Here, think of, think of an extreme case. Think of somebody, somebody who's dying. There's no hope. Uh, and uh, uh, drugs cannot relieve the pain. Uh, and they're uh, not even surrounded by friends and family. They're alone in some nursing home, but they're believers. What, what good could their suffering do? Well, it's very similar to Christ. He was, he was surrounded by enemies. He had no hope. He was in pain and agony. He was dying. Uh, and how important was his suffering? What, what, what did it do for us? It did everything. It opened the gates of heaven. And he has given us the astonishing dignity of uniting our suffering in, in not just our intention and in making us saints that way, but also in execution. They, they do something. What, we, what they do, we don't see. But there may be somebody hundreds of years from now that you never met that will receive enough grace to overcome his sufferings and keep his faith and go to heaven because you've offered your little sufferings to Christ to use as he will in the mystery of his body. Uh, and that is about the most optimistic and exciting and dramatic and hopeful uh, answer to the problem of suffering that I know. It's hard to do. I said I was going to answer the practical problem. Uh, well, the answer's not easy because suffering stinks. None of us like it. That's why it's suffering. But, uh, but what Christ can make of that as what Christ can make of anything in our lives is going to absolutely astound us. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know it's not going to be what we Here's, here's the Bible's description of what we're going to find in heaven. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things God has prepared for those who love him. And I think that includes the glories of suffering. All right, that's all I have to say. It's time for you now to speak your piece and ask questions.
thank you for being so patient with the monologue. Now we have what's much more interesting dialogue. Thank you very much, Dr. Crafe. Um, I appreciated all your different approaches uh, to, to the question. Um, and I especially appreciated what you said that, that suffering is a mystery and that we're not going to have the perfect answer uh, yep. to this question. I think I'll find that that will be very helpful in, in conversations I have with, with others in the, in the future, because if you just give a, a sort of simple and direct answer, they, every people always leave uh, dissatisfied. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, uh, now we can move on to the questions. Oh, yes. Yeah. So at this point, we'll be opening up to the questions that you have submitted. If you're still formulating questions, you can feel free to continue submitting them as we go along. All right, Dr. Crape. So our first question is, if God created Adam and Eve complete and perfect without the need to suffer, why do us after, or why do we after the fall need suffering in order to be perfect, wise, and complete? Because we're not Adam and Eve, because we've lost the preternatural gifts. We've lost that connection with God uh, that doesn't need repair. We're, we're broken houses, so we need a repairman, and suffering is part of the repair. The next question is, to what extent can we say that God suffers? Isn't he unmovable? Oh, that's a good question. There was a controversy in the Middle Ages about that. Uh, and the church decided that uh, uh, it was not correct. It was, it was uh, not orthodox. It was heterodox. It was heretical, actually, to say that the Father is suffering as well as the Son. Uh, God is eternal. And eternity can't suffer. You have to be in time to suffer because suffering is a loss. When you get hit in the face, two things happen. One, you feel pain. Two, uh, your face caves in a little bit. Uh, it's uh, an eternal spirit. You can't do that to, to God. But Christ is fully God and fully man in the same person. His human nature and his divine nature are one. They're hypostatically united. So since Christ is God and since Christ suffered, God suffers. The father doesn't, the son does. He suffers more than anybody else ever did. Even, even if the cross hadn't been such horrible torture, probably the most excruciating torture ever invented by torturers, even if that weren't so, his love and his sensitivity would have multiplied his suffering far beyond ours. Because the more you love somebody, the more you suffer. By the way, if you want to avoid suffering entirely, never give your heart to anybody because it's designed to be broken. And the only way you can have a, a full heart is to have it broken and then put back together. again. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, the next question is, how come suffering taken on voluntarily can be so rewarding and in some ways enjoyable? Why don't I ever enjoy non-voluntary suffering in the same way? Well, let's look at the counterexample of a suffering that is taken on voluntarily because you're a masochist and you hate joy and you hate happiness and you hate yourself. Very sick and that's going to do everybody harm, especially yourself. Contrast that with suffering that's voluntarily undertaken, not out of hate, but out of love. You love somebody and you see them suffer and you say, please, Share your suffering with me. Please let me carry that burden. It's not, not just physically, but spiritually. So it's the love that, uh, uh, that injects into suffering that new meaning. And if that's not there, suffering is worthless. Put love and suffering together, and you get the strongest form in the world. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is, you mentioned the example of people who had gone through the same experience of suffering, the Holocaust, and the different ways in which that tragedy shaped them, some for the better, some for the worse. What do the different outcomes depend on? Read Viktor Frankl's wonderful little book, Man's Search for Meaning. He was a disciple of Freud, 
uh, an atheist uh, and a great psychologist, and he was in Auschwitz, and he was puzzled by the fact that many of his fellow prisoners seemed to uh, to collapse, even though they were healthy and had fairly good privileges and food. Others uh, were tough enough to to last through more horrible sufferings, even though it was unpredictable. Uh, and he was looking for a common factor. And he found it in a uh, uh, kind of faith that their suffering had meaning, had worth, had value. Uh, he likes to quote Nietzsche, of all people, uh, a man can endure almost any how if only he has a why. Uh, in other words, the, the physical conditions around them, the how, didn't determine uh, their destiny as much as whether they believe that this was meaningful or not. If there's a meaning to it, you can embrace it, not not. Look at the difference between uh, the pains of childbirth uh, in a woman who loves and wants her baby versus a woman who doesn't want the baby. Look at the difference between doing a, a hard task for somebody that you love, or a knight in shining armor, versus doing the same task uh, out of fear of a tyrant. The spirit makes more of a difference to the body. Uh, as someone, yeah, who who read uh, *Man's Search for Meaning*, it is a great book. It gets a second recommendation from me. Um, okay, since suffering is somewhat of a mystery, does that prevent us from being able to say if anything in this world is good or bad, since God is the only one who truly knows? Well, we can't doubt that pain is bad on the surface, but we can doubt that it's bad in the depths. Maybe it's good for us, maybe it's not. So some things are clear and some things are not clear. And somebody who says everything is clear is a fool and somebody who says nothing is clear is a fool. So what's probably most mysterious is not just mystery, but the combination of mystery with some clarity. The next question, uh, Dr. Kraft, is very relevant to today and the current situations going on in the world. And so I want to ask if you could comment on the war in Ukraine right now. Three cheers for peace, three, three boos for war. It shows one thing, how incredibly stupid the human race is. What is war? War is a solution. A solution to what? A problem? What problem? Well, I want more territory. I want more power. Uh, I want this and you want that. We have differences. What do we do about it? Shall we talk? Shall we negotiate? Shall we dialogue? Shall we compromise? Shall we uh, work together? No, let's, let's dress up in funny uniforms and, and get lethal weapons and find some nice place where we go out and kill each other tomorrow morning. What a great idea. Thank you. If your statement, okay, so this is going back to, to one of the earlier questions about, about Adam, and Eve, Adam and Eve. If your statement of Adam and Eve is true, uh, then does that mean we are responsible for actions we as individuals had no agency in? I guess they're referring to the actions of no. Adam and Eve. No, the church is very clear about that. Original sin doesn't send you to hell. The condition that we're born in, namely, uh, we're selfish and we're stupid. We pop out of the womb programmed to, I want what I want when I want it. And if we're not socialized, if we're not taught, if we're not trained, if we're not tamed, we become monsters. Uh, look, look what little babies do. They scream if they don't get what they want. And they reach out and, and hit anybody that's in their way. That's us. We have to be socialized. Okay. Original sin is... Of, of all Christian doctrines, uh, the only one that can be proved by just reading the daily newspapers. That's a quote from Chester. Uh, so you don't go to hell for original sin. You go to hell for your own sins. You're born weak because of Adam and Eve's sin. But that's what 
heredity means. That's what the family is. You, you, you receive from your parents all sorts of good things you didn't deserve and all sorts of bad things you didn't deserve. Suppose, for instance, your mother was a drug addict, uh, and uh, she was a druggie when you got when she got pregnant with you, and you were born addicted. Is that your fault? Of course not. Are you responsible for that? No. Well, why do you have it? Because because we're not angels. Angels are pure, purely free individuals. We have heredity. We depend on our ancestors. We get all sorts of great things from them, starting with life itself. And we get this original sin from them too. Original sin doesn't mean your first sin or Adam's first sin. It means that the condition of selfishness and stupidity that we're born with, because that first iron ring detached itself from the magnet. But then the magnet came down and reattached itself. And the next question is, why is heaven always envisioned to be in the afterlife, but so rarely in our world here today? I think there must be some profundity to that question that I don't understand, because if, if that's a question for you, if you wonder why people don't say this world is perfect and it's heaven, uh, I think you're living in another world. Uh, I think what you mean by that is, might it not be true that this world is closer to heaven than we think? Might it not be true that when we get to heaven, we'll look back on our life on earth and say, you know, that was the beginning of my heaven. I thought I wasn't in heaven yet, but, but I was. I think that's a profound thought. Here, when you're born, you're born into a much bigger world. And when you're in your mother's womb, you're still in that world, but you don't see it. But after, after you're born, you see it. Well, I think death might be something like that. Uh, this universe is much more than, than heaven has got to be bigger than earth here in the whole universe. All right. When you pop out of this universe into this larger world, or at least larger kind of world, you look back at your life in this world. And I think you it's very likely that we'll say the same thing that we say when we look back at our mother's womb. I was already in heaven, I just didn't see it. And those in hell will probably say the same thing, but they'll identify this life as hell. The roots of a plant are not seen, but they're the roots of a plant. So the roots of our heavenly life are planted in this life. That's why what we do in this life is so dramatic. It determines our eternal destiny. You don't see it until the plant breaks the surface. So that's what you mean by the question. I think it's very profound. Uh, if what you mean is, isn't this earth good enough for heaven? And the answer is certainly not. We all have a lot of us quarrel with the world. None of us are totally satisfied with this world if we're sane. By the way, that dissatisfaction is, I think, a very strong argument for the existence of a next world. Every natural desire, every innate desire that's in all human beings universally, not just from advertising or ideology or from the outside for it, corresponds to something real. If there's a hunger, there's a food that can satisfy the hunger. If there's thirst, there's drink. If there's sexual desire, there's sex. If there's loneliness, there's friendship. If there's curiosity, there's truth. And if there's a desire for something better than this world, there's got to be something better than this world. The next question is, what meaning does suffering hold if it causes loss of faith rather than a stronger faith? Suffering tests faith. And sometimes it uh, is the occasion for a loss of faith temporarily. Uh, and then the recovery of that lost faith makes you appreciate what you've lost more. You don't know if that's your story or not until it happens. So you can't rationalize and say, well, I think I shall lose my faith so that I can gain it again and appreciate it better. That's just dishonest. But certainly suffering is a test of faith. And faith is not possible in a world where it's not tested. You don't have to have faith at two and two or four that the sun is shining. So it makes you stronger. 
Uh, without God in the picture, like in the case of an atheist, would there be any meaning to suffering? Yeah, God often works anonymously. Here, I'll give you an example. Albert, Albert Camus, an atheist all of his life, very good writer, uh, had a dark side, but uh, he, was a, he was a moralist. He was not a believer, but uh, he confessed that well, he said this in some of his letters, and he also said this through his, I think, his best book, The Plague. The hero of that book, Dr. Rue, is an atheist, like Camus. But he knows that the meaning of life is to be a saint. So he stays in Algeria when the plague breaks out and catches the plague himself and is going to die, even though he could go back to France where he has a comfortable practice. Why, he's right there. Asking, well, you're not religious, no. You don't believe in God, no. Why do you do this? Well, I don't know whether God exists or not, but I know that the meaning of life is to become a saint. I don't know about religion, but I know about morality. Well, I think God's at work in him. And if he had lived another 10 years, I think he would have been a profound Christian. Uh, God, God loves to be anonymous. Uh, God's, God's in many more places than he seems to be. So a good atheist is, is somebody who's, who may not even consciously realize he's searching for God, but he is. That's not necessary. Atheists can be the opposite. And religious people can be the opposite. At the last judgment, there are going to be a lot of surprises. Some of the last will be first and some of the first will be last. I'll have to use that quote, God God loves to be anonymous at some point. Um, Look at the sun. Uh, I mean, if, if, if that light and heat is not a, a natural divine symbol, and what do we do with the sun? We take it for granted, or else like Akhenaten, we worship it as a god, or Apollo. Uh, look, every time a baby is conceived in a woman's womb, it's a miracle. And every time a priest says the words, this is my body, uh, over the altar, a miracle happens. But anonymously, millions of times every day around the world. Those are the two holiest places in the world. That's why the devil loves to get at them. Lots of good wisdom there. Um, the next question is... Um, Someone is, uh, says that, uh, Dr. Kraft, you have mentioned uh, before that you have ADHD. How do you manage to read and write so much uh, for those of us who may suffer the same issue? I haven't the faintest idea. Uh, I think one of my both defects and blessings is that I'm not at all good at answering the question, how do I do this? Because if I start saying how to do this, I get all confused. Uh, one of the great tactics in most sports is to uh, sow confusion in the enemy by asking him how he does it. I once won a bowling tournament on my college team. I'm not that good a bowler. Uh, we had a uh, we had to face somebody with a with like a 200 average. We all had like 130 average. So I said to him before we uh, we played the, in the playoff game, you you have the best uh, stance and the best. Uh, uh, physical accoutrements uh, and the best strategy I've ever seen. Uh, but uh, I've read a lot of books about, about bowling, but uh, uh, none of the books ever told me what you do with your left hand when you're releasing the ball with your right hand. And he said, I don't know, I'll do. I said, okay, I'll, I'll watch you. You have such a perfect stance. Well, he was so worried about his left hand that he bowled like 130 with a lot of gutter balls and we beat him. So you can get in your own way very easily. How am I doing this? Forget it, just do it. How do you love? I think the, the best, one of the best answers I ever gave to anybody was uh, a guy that was much older than me. Not many, many people are much older than me anymore, but then he was. And he said, uh, uh, all my life, I've, I've, I've tried uh, to be a believer. I know what you teach and it makes logical sense, but I just can't give myself to God. I can't make that leap of faith. And I said, well, uh, you know who God is, right? Yeah, God is love. And uh, he's lovable, right? Yeah, yeah, but I just can't do it. Well, who do you love on earth 
Well, she said, my wife. I said, okay, suppose your wife were on the other side of that door and the door was locked. He knocked on the door. He said, John, John, open the door to me. What would you do? He said, I'd get up from my chair as fast as I could and I'd, I'd go and open the door to her. I said, but, but how would you do that? What do you mean, how? Well, you're asking how to make the act of faith. I'm saying, how do you get up from your chair and how do you walk across the room and how do you open the door? He said, I don't know. I guess I just use my muscles. Oh, you don't have to know. You just do it. We'll do the same thing to God. He said, oh my God, it's so easy. Once you do it, it's easy, but sometimes we make obstacles for ourselves and make it very difficult. Do it. You just say yes. Sounds like some very useful for information for myself and probably a lot of other people. The next question is, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why didn't he make a world where suffering was not a prerequisite for true happiness? Maybe he did. Maybe he made a lot of worlds. Maybe ours is only one. That's like saying, if, uh, if Shakespeare could write so many great tragedies, why did he write comedies too? Or vice versa. Uh, that kind of question, why did God did do this or why didn't God do this, uh, rarely has an answer. Because we're not God. Uh, read the book of Job once again. I love God's answer. God's a great humorist. God's the greatest of comedians. Uh, hey, Job, um, I didn't notice you with the angels advising me when I created the world. Were you there? I was not listening. Okay. The next question is, how can one help another who experiences many passive evils and suffers much? What role do we have as humans to, tell, to help each other through suffering? There are two answers to that question. The psychological answer, what do you say and what do you do, and what techniques do you use, uh, I don't have much wisdom about. But the philosophical answer and the most important answer is just be there with them. Never leave them, never turn them down, never abandon them. Just say, I'm there for you. That's, that's the same thing you do when somebody's dying. The worst thing in the world is loneliness, total loneliness. There's a remarkable book called City of Joy by the secular journalist Dominic Lapierre, I think his last name is. He's the one who wrote the Is Paris Burning? Uh, it's about Calcutta. And uh, it's not a uh, religious book as such, and he's not a believer as far as I know, but uh, he talks about the, uh, the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, especially the lepers, and the joy they have in their suffering, simply because they're totally dependent on each other. They're a, they're a family. Uh, the poor smile more than the rich. Here, what's the poorest subcontinent in the world, sub-Saharan Africa? What's the richest continent in the world, Scandinavia? Well, uh, Africans smile the most and Scandinavians smile the least. Scandinavians are the richest, Africans are the poorest. There's even an organization called the Global Happiness Project, which relate, which uh, gives some sort of prize to the five happiest countries in the world and some sort of a warning to the five unhappiest countries in the world. Every year they pick those two, but they, they don't listen to smiles. They just listen to bank accounts. Five unhappiest nations of the world are always in sub-Saharan Africa. They're terribly poor and their political systems are usually pretty corrupt. And the five happiest countries in the world are Scandinavian countries because their economy is, uh, is very good and um, health services are good and, and uh, life expectancy is good and, and there's very little poverty. How come they don't smile? How come the suicide rate is much higher in Scandinavia than in Africa? They have family, they have solidarity, they lean on each other, they have real community. That's very interesting points. I hadn't realized that about those two different countries. Uh, the next question is asking if you could comment on suffering caused by natural disasters, ones that are not really linked to sin. No, I'll answer that question very simply. I don't know. 
how and why God uses tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes uh, any more than I know how he he uses uh, the blessings of nature are here and not there. Uh, what we know is that we can't predict that. Uh, Jesus himself says something like that. He said that uh, he referred to a tower that had collapsed and killed a lot of people. He said, do, do, do you think that the people who were killed by that tower were, were more wicked than the others who weren't? No. And I think what he was saying by that example is we don't know God's strategy. We're not God, once again. Okay, our next question is a, is a little more uh, personal. There, someone's asking, "What is the greatest moment of suffering in your life?" If you're if you're willing to share or share some something about that experience. When my five year old daughter was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor and given six, six months to live, uh, I felt that uh, God made a mistake. I'm I'm not this kind of tough, courageous person who can take this. Uh, but we got a miracle. She's fine. She's 50 years old. People prayed for her. The, the surgeon who happened to be an atheist was, was astounded that the tumor was different than what it showed up on the x-ray. But that week was hell for the operation. Thank you very much for sharing that. The next question is very broad. It's why is there so much suffering in the world? Because there's so much sin in the world. And also because there's so much divine wisdom in the world that knows how to deal with it. He's a surgeon. He's doing heart surgery. And that requires a lot of probing. And it's not easy. And that's probably why we have to die, because death is like an anesthetic. We're his patients, and we keep telling him how to operate, and we keep hopping around on the operating table and interfering with the operation, so he has to anesthetize it. All right. If God created suffering and God is good, then why is suffering portrayed as being evil rather than good? Or, or maybe if we... Well, first of all, he didn't, cre he didn't create suffering, and he didn't create death. Uh, and secondly, suffering isn't simply evil. It's not sinful. It's bad. It's not evil. It's not wicked. Uh, in general, suffering and sin are connected, but we don't know how it works out individually. Why does this person suffer more than that person? We know why we suffered in general, as, as humans. But we don't know why Job suffers. And why some mafia hitman doesn't suffer and dies in his bed with a smile on his face at the age of 90. We don't know. There are weird characters in God's drama. But it's, it's all going to come clear in the end. But we're not at the end. The next, the next question is, um, what type of prayer or maybe a devotion to a particular saint would help me get through the hard days of suffering? The obvious answer is the saint who next to Jesus suffered the most, his mother. She was with him to the last and she participated in all, all of his suffering. Uh, watch Mel Gibson wonderful movie, The Passion of the Christ, again. That'll put you right in, in the presence. Another uh, viewer is asking, what is the best book on the topic of, of suffering or the, the meaning of suffering that you would recommend? By best, you mean the one that God provided for us. It's the book of Job. Uh, if by best you mean the most clear and adequate philosophy, it's C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain. If you mean the best book to give to you when you're grieving, I would say, once again, C.S. Lewis, The Grief Observed. If you want a second rate, a little clearer book on suffering, you could try my making sense out of suffering, 
wrote the book because the publisher came to me and said, uh, uh, please write a book on the problem of evil, uh, especially suffering. And I said, no, I can't do that. C.S. Lewis wrote the best one. Great book. I can't write a great book. And then next week, the week after that, they said, um, we would ask you to reconsider. We don't want you to write a great book. We just want you to write a second rate book because people can't read great books anymore. Well, I don't know what people can read, but I'll write a second rate book. But Lewis's book is not easy. Uh, you don't have to be a professional, anything to, to understand it, but you have to read it slowly and carefully a couple of times, but it's rewarding. The next question is, sometimes suffering is a result of other actions, but if you have OCD that causes remembrance of these actions, how do you overcome the mental disorder? Ask a good psychologist uh, and, and use common sense. Some psychologists uh, have common sense, don't. So use common sense to distinguish the two. But I, I don't know enough about the details to say anything more than, than you will know already, I think. Another uh, audience member asks, has your understanding of suffering changed uh, from being a Calvinist to becoming a Catholic? I think I was always enough of a common sense person, even as a Calvinist, so I didn't go into the doom and gloom thing uh, and carry that over as a Catholic. Uh, I think the main change has been as I go deeper into philosophy, I see its limitations more. And I'm less ambitious to find or write the definitive answer to the problem of suffering and refute all the objections. I'm satisfied with, with, with clues. In one sense, life becomes simpler as you get older. In another sense, it becomes less simple. You realize that it's, that it's not meant to be simple. Satisfied with clues. Okay, um, so I think that is all the time we have for questions, Dr. Kraft. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you for your very good questions. Yes, the audience, they did it. They had a lot of good questions, I'm glad. Um, so thank you again for coming to speak and for your contributions uh, to the Newman Lecture Series um, and for years of your years of work um, with your books and, and your, your teaching and your speaking. Um, in educating us on the, these, all these different varied topics uh, in philosophy and, and religion. Thank you for your work and God bless you and your work. Right now we'd like to give a special thank you to all of our sponsors whose support has made these intellectually stimulating conversations along with all that we do here at the Newman Center possible. And if you're interested in supporting the Newman Lectures, please visit our website at osunewman.org. And then uh, before we, we close, we have a couple announcements we wanted to share with you. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, and if you're a student at Oregon State University, uh, then we'd like to let you know about the Alpha Course, uh, which is a series of meetings every Tuesday where we have honest, open discussions about the big questions in life, uh, questions similar to what we discussed today about the meaning of suffering. Uh, there will be free dinner. Uh, a short talk on one of these big questions, and then a discussion uh, amongst your peers. The first meeting will be for this term will be Tuesday, April 12th in the MU multipurpose room 13. Uh, and there's more information on our website, osunewman.org. And we also wanted to let you know uh, about our Go Fish conference, uh, which is coming up at the end of the month. It's a Catholic conference for students and, and young adults, uh, there's gonna be speakers speaking on truth, goodness, and beauty, um, and lots of fun. Uh, it's an opportunity to meet with other Catholic students. Uh, it'll be in Newport, so there'll be a bonfire out on the beach. Uh, so th this is for those in the, the Pacific Northwest area. Uh, so, and you can learn more about that at gofishconference.com. Okay, and so this concludes our lecture. And to close, we have a video to show you about the Newman Center. 
Uh, thank you all for your participation and have a wonderful evening. In a world of success in one direction, comfort without aspiration, love without intimacy, individualism without solitude, running without purpose, knowledge without wisdom, company without community, and laughter without joy. We believe that good things can be better. We present an alternative. We want everyone to know that they are not stuck, that there is more, that we have not experienced it all, that there is an alternative. We believe in love and friendship, in union with God and interior life. We believe in development and creativity. We believe in respect and care, in the pursuit of knowledge and the attainment of wisdom. We believe in contentment, happiness, and joy. We believe in Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever.